Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma and we are doing introduction to Chinese studies. Today we are going to do the fifth lecture which is a very interesting uh, topic, religion in China. China is an ancient civilization. So ancient civilization actually developed on the banks of rivers because uh, civilization begins with settlement and so uh, people settle down on rivers and where agriculture is possible, there is enough food to feed a large population and so as a result people have uh, a kind of a hierarchical system because there are some people who are engaged in agriculture, there are others who are administering the large number of people and this, uh, these administrators then uh, you know uh, develop institutions and ideas that are used to keep the society united and so that is how religion developed. So religion developed in every civilization. So say for example the Egyptian civilization. So it had its own religion uh, and its own gods who, cre who, who created this world according to their own myths. And then Mesopotamian civilization also had their own gods. And then on the, on the banks of the Sindhu river and, and, and the, the seven rivers in India. Uh, the Vedic civilization developed, who, who, which uh, not only had their gods but also had their uh, sacred scriptures. So along the same lines, on the banks of the Yellow River, the Chinese civilization also developed a, a religion. Now the word re religion may be kind of a western construct, but uh, if, you, if you compare the definition, say apply the definition of uh, religion to this civilization, uh, we can say that okay, there was some form of religion in, in, in these spaces because religion basically refers to some gods and people worshipping those gods and uh, uh, certain principles that are derived from these gods, some rules and regulations uh, which help the society to be united because uh, religion comes from the word uh, uh, to unite, to unite the people. Okay, so, so these are some of the basic features of religion that are present in China also. Now the Chinese people consider themselves to be descendants of the yellow emperor, Wang Ti. Wang, uh, Wang means yellow, Ti means lord so, or, or, or emperor. So uh, the Chinese venerated uh, their ancient uh, sage kings. So they believed that there were certain sage kings who actually laid the foundation of human society. Um, some says one king uh, brought in agriculture, another uh, brought in trade, someone established the laws. So in that way they have their own stories that uh, they used to tell their people and, and these stories basically kept the Chinese people united. So that became the basis of the Chinese civilization and even today the yellow emperor is worshipped in China. As you can see this is a temple dedicated to the yellow emperor. And, and the term, uh, the name for the emperor Wang Ti actually comes from the yellow emperor. So Shri Wang Ti, the first uh, uh, king to unite uh, uh, all the different uh, kingdoms of China and, and to create the first empire, the Qin empire, he took the title Shri Wang Ti. So, so this comes from the yellow emperor. So yellow emperor was venerated in China. Besides that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Chinese also had their myths about creation, how this world came into being. So one is say how human society came into existence. So the human society came into existence or agriculture, uh, irrigation, embankments and trade and those came into existence because of uh, the work done by great sages or uh, the, who were kings. And uh, But uh, the question is how did this world come into being? So in the pre-scientific age, everyone had some kind of a uh, mystical, uh, which is non-material type of an origin of, 
of, of the universe. So there are many myths uh, in, in China, but one of them is uh, the myth of Fangku. So Fangku, this is Fangku. He basically was uh, the, the product of the feminine and the masculine principle. So the originally there, uh, out of the cosmic egg came the feminine and the masculine principle and Fangku grew in between. And so uh, one became the, the masculine principle became the sky and the feminine principle became the earth. And in between was Fangku and, and Fangku grew to a huge size, it's I don't know, 18,000 feet or something like that. And, uh, and his body parts then became uh, plants, animals and seas and rivers and mountains. And so that is how all the physical features of this world came into being. So that is a myth, okay, because in the scientific age, we know how things have developed scientifically. But uh, you know, ancient people, they had to have some myth, some understanding, some explanation, just some stories to tell their children. So China also had many rich traditions like that. So they had their own gods. So they are god of agriculture, god of uh, earth, god of uh, river. So they used to worship those gods. So say they want rain, they would do some worship. and So like that. So Chinese people had their own gods and then they had their kings and also they had their stories. So in that way, religion began in uh, China. Now, uh, there is no name given to this type of religion. Say the, the Abrahamic religions would uh, call these practices or traditions as pagan traditions or you can say polytheistic tradition. These are the different names that are given. But every religion is unique. Say in India, we use say the term Hinduism to, to describe the religion of India. Uh, there is no similar term that is used for China. In China, uh, uh, there are some traditions which have been named, but they are named uh, on, on, uh, on the basis of philosophies, for example, Confucianism or Taoism. So in that way, uh, certain traditions are named. But there is something common also in China, kind of a common veneration of these gods and sages and uh, these uh, common stories that the Chinese people share, irrespective of whether they believed in the philosophy of legalism or Confucianism or Taoism. Uh, but there is no single name that is given to the Chinese religion. Often in, in, in surveys, the term Chinese folk religions or ethnic religions are used. So, so you can say Chinese religions in that way. Now, uh, Chinese also had a theology. So, uh, in, in the Shang dynasty period, this is before uh, uh, year 1046 BCE, now, uh, the modern historians in the beginning did not believe that uh, the Shang dynasty existed. They believed that Chinese civilization begins with the Chou dynasty because there are written records of, of Chou dynasty. Chou, during Chou dynasty period, certain sacred texts were written down. Uh, but uh, in the recent decades, oracle bones were discovered. And these oracle bones basically had Chinese writings which contained the names of the Shang kings. And they were dedicated to different gods. So the oracle bones, uh, basically oracle, uh, these are uh, these are written on fish bones, and so they were preserved. And uh, that established that before the Chou, there was the Shang dynasty, and and the list of kings basically matched with the the ancient uh, Chinese historical writings. So it was confirmed that there was a Shang dynasty, and perhaps there was also the Xia dynasty. Xia dynasty is considered to be the first dynasty of China. Now the Shang dynasty had many gods. The supreme god was Shangti. Shangti, T again, Lord. Okay, Shangti. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, prayers or invocations of Shangti in these oracle bones that we find in the during the Shang uh, dynasty period. Uh, when the Chou dynasty came to power, now the Chou was a neighboring subordinate kingdom to the Shang, then it overthrew the Shang dynasty and became the main power in China. Now they introduced their own god known as Thian. Thian. Thian basically means, this is Thian. Thian basically means heaven or sky. So the word for sky is Thian. 
and so that that in a religious sense the word heaven is used so they, when the english went there they translated theon into heaven but that heaven is not like uh, say a christian heaven where where people go after death and and there are uh, pleasurable things there and so on or god lives there and you serve god there it's not something like that the concept of theon is an impersonal concept so the so the chou dynasty uh, scholars they argued that uh, there is a kind of a cosmic order there are certain rules which uh, are implemented by by this kind of a cosmic power which does not have any form it is not one person but it is some kind of a power and that is called theon and and, and so so long as the people follow the the uh, or or are in harmony with the rules of of theon they of give sacrifices to the theon especially the emperor offer sacrifices to the to theon and and rules according to uh, virtue so theon theon be, uh, actually implements virtue in, on earth and so so long as the emperor is virtuous the state or society will remain stable people will be happy there will be enough food to eat there will be no conflicts there will be no diseases epidemics there won't be any foreign aggression so that means heaven is happy and peop so people will also be happy but if there is some disturbance so there is some foreign aggression there is some epidemic or there is some famine that would indicate that theon is no longer happy there is some problem there is some imbalance maybe because the king is not virtuous because the king committed some uh, sinful act okay right? like killing a good person or something like that or the king is not dedicated to performance of duties or the people have become or given up virtue they are no longer harmonious with with uh, the the rules and regulations of heaven so uh, in that case the dynasty would be overthrown by a new dynasty so that is the justification the chou dynasty used again the shang dynasty because the shang dynasty had become weak it they had become uh, wiseful given up virtue and therefore heaven had taken away the mandate from them they no longer had the mandate to rule and so they are replaced by a better dynasty the chou dynasty now the chou dynasty when it came to power it did not eliminate the 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 shang aristocrats and the ruling class instead what did they did was they distributed lands to them so that uh, you know they can also participate in the new system and and, and so that they don't uh, become agitated or they don't, don't try to seek revenge and uh, so that also created a kind of a healthy precedence that any new dynasty which comes to power does not kill all the members of the previous dynasty instead what it does is it co-ops the older dynasty gives them high titles and uh, give them land and and use their help in order to rule the people because people are used to that older dynasty but because the new dynasty is more virtuous than the older dynasty therefore they have the right to rule or so they their leader the emperor has the right to rule and so the emperor was also called as uh, thianzi son of son of heaven okay so there is an intermediary between heaven and earth so this is a type of a cosmology that the ancient chinese developed okay so beginning with uh, the stories of uh, great sage kings and how how universe was created uh, and 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 then worshiping certain gods like uh, shanti to this concept of heaven and how heaven rules over us through certain cosmic law or say tao the way the path okay there is a path that uh, you need to follow if you follow the right path the tao then uh, you know everything falls in place there harmony her in 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 society and in case the her is disturbed or or people deviate from the tao then then how will be disturbed uh, harmony will be disturbed and then mandate of heaven will change and natural calamities and and all the problems that uh, uh, people face are all the result of going against the will of heaven so th this was the ancient chinese religion now uh, the chinese had their own scriptures or uh, which uh, uh, were uh, books which were mostly written by confucian uh, uh, scholars so some of them were written by confucius himself some of them were pre confucius 
okay these 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 uh, uh, contain certain uh, ideas which which existed even before confucius and confucius is said to have uh, uh, he he is said to have compiled these ideas in in book form and but these ideas predated confucius now there are four books and five classics so these were compulsory texts that the any civil servant had to study in china so in china there was civil service exam which of course came much later it did not come in the chou dynasty period but about uh, almost 1000 or, or, or 700 800 years after the chou dynasty during the tang dynasty period and then the song dynasty period this uh, civil service exams were introduced now this civil service exams were based on essays that had to be written and these essays were based on the confucian uh, scriptures now four books and five classics so the four books are great learning which is a, a commentary by chang zi he was a student of confucius then doctrine of the of the mean that is attributed to zi si zi si is uh, was the grandson of confucius now uh, i i did not mention why confucius is so important now Con confucius was or, or say in, in chinese his name would be kung fu zi and so when when the europeans they uh, wrote down the name they made it confucius so uh, confucius means nothing but kung fu zi zi means master okay so kung is the family name so in that way the name confucius is derived now confucius was a descendant of of the shang dynasty and so he was a aristocrat and uh, he admired the duke of chou duke of chou was uh, the younger brother of the the chou emperor the first chou emperor and uh, when the emperor died uh, he, his his nephew was still a minor and so he became the regent but he ruled uh, very uh, with a lot of wisdom he did not want power for himself and once uh, his nephew became came of age he simply gave up his power and handed over the empire to his nephew and therefore he is admired he is considered to be a, a sage uh, so he is believed to have introduced the uh, feudal system in china okay so he divided land among the elite and then in turn the elite collected taxes from the peasants and therefore he he used to be revered by confucius and and the confucian tradition and for the same reason he was vilified by the communist okay because he is supposed to have created this hierarchical method of land ownership and in the new egalitarian communist age that was considered to be very regressive now confucius because he was very wise and uh, he did lot of uh, literary work he admired the past he talk about the golden age when the chou dynasty was established and, and and so he 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 gathered large number of followers just like say in greece socrates he he gathered followers so similarly confucius also gathered large number of followers and after his death although in his lifetime he was not very successful he advised certain kingdoms but those kingdoms were not very successful but after his death his his uh, disciples continued to to propagate his work so uh, like the four books are written by some of his disciples for i, I have already named chang zi then zi si they are all his disciples okay uh, analects of course are uh, confucius own speeches and discussions with his students and then the fourth book is mencius mencius was the most famous disciple of confucius okay uh, uh, of course he, he was not a contemporary of confucius but he he was a follower of confucius's grandson and so he wrote uh, his own he had his own conversation and speeches they were collected in a book called mencius and Me again mencius is a latinized name his his real name is meng zi master meng then there were uh, five classics so these were the four books and then there were five classics Uh, the classic of poetry which contain various hymns which were uh, composed during the early chou period okay praising heaven and uh, praising the great uh, uh, sages then uh, the book of documents these were uh, say you can say in today's parlance you would call them uh, legal texts documents that 
that recorded how the state system was organized, who were the rulers of, of the mythical era, then the PCI era, then the Xia dynasty era, then the Shang dynasty era up, uh, up era up to the Zhou dynasty era. So these are the records of those periods. Uh, then there was the Book of Rites, which was composed in the later Zhou period. And they contain how, how the sacrifices have to be performed to heaven, so on and so forth. Then there is this mystical book known as uh, I Ching. So the book of changes. Okay, So this is a book of uh, divination, how to predict the future, how to know if there is some problem. If there is some problem, then uh, people could go to these uh, oracles and ask what has happened, what wrong has happened and they would give some predictions. They would recommend certain. So if someone is sick, they will recommend certain uh, methods to be used to cure the sickness. And they also, uh, this book also talks about the cosmology of Ying and Yang. That is, uh, I showed you Fangku, Ying, this, this, this symbol, Tai Chi Tu. Okay, there is the black side and there is the white side. It is not reflected in this particular picture. But uh, one side is black and other side is white. But within that black, there is small circle of white within the black and there is a small circle of black within the white okay so so both, both are together so uh, so this type of you know, cosmological ideas which has some philosophical content content was contained in this particular book and then spring and autumn annals they, these contain the records of the state of lu from uh, from which confucius came so because this was a period of uh, several kingdoms. There was no single empire. The Chou dynasty had become weak and China had divided into several smaller kingdoms. So one such kingdom was the state of Lu. So there was the, the, the Chou emperor but he did not have control over China. And instead these smaller states uh, uh, appeared. And so one, one such state was Lu and this spring and autumn annals contain, contain um, uh, you know the narrations of how how the state came into being, who are the rulers, and so on and so forth. And based on this particular book, uh, the the period is also named spring spring and autumn period. And so these were some kind of a religious text in that sense, if you if you use the term in that sense. It is not a scripture in the sense of say the Bible or the Quran or even the Vedas. It, it's it's a bit different. These these were revered a lot. People did not make changes to them. Okay, these were set in stone. At one point of time, they were finalized. Once they were finalized, they were revered. They were they became changeless, and they were considered to be perfect. And therefore, these exams were based on study of these texts. But the content of uh, these texts was less theological and more historical, political in nature. Okay, so so in that sense, Chinese religion was unique. It was different from uh, the Abrahamic religions. And also different in a sense from the Vedic religion. Now, uh, in the religious scene of China, then entered Buddhism. Now, this is very important development. Now, before Buddhism, Chinese had beliefs that I have discussed, but uh, deeper, say, theological and spiritual beliefs came through Buddhism. Now, Buddhism was born in India, as you can see, this area here this brown area this is the birthplace of buddhism okay buddha himself was born in uh, lumbini in which is in nepal now and then he went around and preached say he preached in saranath and in magadha and uh, there's bodh gaya so all these are in um, say nepal uttar pradesh bihar today in terms of today's uh, political divisions from there buddhism began to grow all over india and then uh, one of the great emperors of India, Ashoka, he converted to Buddhism. And, uh, and he was a great emperor because his, his grandfather had built a, a Chakravarti Samrajya with the help of uh, his, uh, his guru and prime minister uh, Chanakya. He had built this great empire from the Himalayas to the oceans. And so Ashoka inherited such a great empire. But he used his power not for Digvijaya, that is sending his military all over the world and conquering other countries, but for Dharma Vijaya to spread the teachings of the Buddha. So he sent missions to say Sri Lanka, 
where uh, he converted the Sinhalese people into Buddhism. He sent his own son and daughter, uh, Mahendra and uh, Sangamitra, to Sri Lanka to convert the Sinhala people. So Buddhism began to spread in in this way, and 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 then gradually there are many other kings who who uh, uh, ruled India who who also became Buddhist. Whether it was the Greek Menander or it was uh, the Kushan Kanishka, they became great. Uh, they were great emperors uh, who converted to Buddhism, and they also helped in the spread of Buddhism and different forms of Buddhism because you know the Buddhist. Uh, developed philosophy and there were debates and, and and based on that certain streams developed within Buddhism. The main division which emerged was between uh, the Theravada school of Buddhism which is indicated by the green arrows represent the Theravada because it was going to the south. So it is also known as the southern school while uh, Mahayana is the it became the eastern school because it spread far into the east, into China, into Japan, while Theravada spread towards the south from Sri Lanka and then into Burma and Thailand and so on. So the difference between the, the, the two schools basically was that the Theravadas, which literally means the school of the elders, the, the doctrine of the elders, which is a more simplistic form of Buddhism. It is based on uh, the three pitaka, or which is also known as the Pali Canon, which is basically three parts. The three parts are Vinaya pita, uh, Pitaka, then uh, Sutra Pitaka, and Abhidharma Pitaka. So these are basically uh, teachings of Buddha. And uh, the Theravadas, they believe in achieving Nirvana. So basically, uh, follow the rules and regulations set by Buddha. If you follow that path, then you can achieve nirvana. They have their own monks who uh, you know, take strict vows and they follow certain rules and regulations. And then the lay people who live their life according to the guidance given by the monks. So that is a simple kind of a system. While Mahayana is more philosophical, the Mahayana school, and the literal meaning of Mahayana is the, uh, is the great vehicle or the large vehicle. And so they call Theravada as Hinayana, smaller vehicle, there is a smaller path because you are just looking for your own individual salvation and that is very difficult. But Mahayana is greater because it is, it, it, you are not looking for your own salvation but the salvation of, a salvation basically is a Christian word, so say liberation from the samsara, the cycle of birth and death. So you are trying to liberate yourself from this particular cycle. And, and, and so Mahayana is greater because they, they have a concept of Bodhisattva. So Bodhisattva are, are those people who have attained Nirvana, but they don't uh, take liberation. They postpone their liberation and take their rebirth in order to help others. So in the Mahayana school, you can worship these Bodhisattvas and by worshipping the Bodhisattvas, what happens is they help you to achieve, uh, achieve liberation. So that is stepwise. So you keep worshipping and, 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 and these bodhisattvas are supposed to have very great powers and so they can create heaven, for, uh, different kinds of heavens. For example, Amitava has its own heaven and these heavens were known as pure land. Okay, you go to this pure land where everything is very nice because this earth is, is full of disturbance. There is a lot of maya and, and distractions in this earth. There is a lot of suffering in this earth. So spiritual practice is not easy on this earth. And therefore, these bodhisattvas has created, have created a, a different uh, pure lands where you can go if you do perform good deeds and, and, and then you can achieve uh, higher credits there okay, by, by, by performing good actions. And that is a very good place to perform good karma, karma action. And Buddhism also had this idea of uh, reincarnation. So in, in the cycle of sansara, you take rebirth so on and so forth. So, the, so the ordinary people also take rebirth, but they take rebirth because of their karma. But the bodhisattvas, they take rebirth, not because of their karma, but to help others. Okay, so, so this is basically the concept of Mahayana. So Mahayana became more popular later on. And this version of Buddhism, that spread into, into China. So it, it basically through the Silk Road, during the Han Dynasty period, it started 
uh, going into into china as you can see here now sometime later after a few centuries a third school developed known as the uh, vajrayana school vajra means lightning so vajrayana means lightning vehicle this is a vehicle which goes with lightning speed even better than mahayana so it is a part of mahayana but uh, a, a more esoteric aspect of mahayana so this is based on the tantra and and you can see it originated basically around in bengal where the tantric tradition was very popular there was this goddess wor worship there is a tara peet in 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 west uh, west bengal and and tara is a very important de deity in the tantric form of buddhism now uh, the the tibetans had built up very great empire this was around the 7th and 8th century and they 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 expanded their empire now they were stopped by the chinese and the arabs on two sides but when they came to india so uh, they instead of conquering india what happened is they got converted to buddhism they became influenced by buddhist ideas in bengal that is the uh, vajrayana buddhism and they took these ideas into tibet and they became buddhist so this form of buddhism is known as tibetan buddhism so tibetans basically follow mahayana school but of the vajrayana variety or the tantric variety which involves a lot of worship of different deities it it, it they they uh, create uh, different uh, symbols and there are mandalas that they make which has some special powers and they have different lamas okay the, the, uh, this lama type of buddhism where, where these lamas are representatives of or, or reincarnations of uh, powerful go gods for example amitava the pancham lama is the reincarnation of amitava who created pure land or there is this great deity the merciful deity of avalokiteshwara who the dalai lama is a reincarnation of so uh, so this is how tibetan buddhism spread and so that is known as the northern school of buddhism so it went into tibet and from tibet it went into mongolia so the mongols also converted into the vajrayana form of buddhism so in this is a very good map and in this map you can see how buddhism at one point was prevalent all the way from central asia to southeast asia it even shows how into philippines it had travel smaller portion in different indonesian islands okay so it became very popular but gradually it began to decline and uh, is now more restricted to these areas here okay in tibet or china and japan uh, bit in korea and and indo china peninsula here so the, now uh, it has become more restricted this is another map which which shows the flow of buddhism here i also have mentioned some important personalities that we should know about so the credit for establishing mahayana buddhism in china is uh, the credit should go to kumara jiva who was a indian monk and scholar who went to china he translated sanskrit classics into the chinese languages he belonged to the madhyamika philosophy so within mahayana also there are two important philosophies Ma madhyamika and yogachara so Madh madhyamika basically follows the shunyavad philosophy that uh, the ultimate shunya which is which is the ultimate essence and uh, out of that essence this samsara comes into being and the ultimate goal of nirvana is to merge into that shunya lose your identity lose your ego and become shunya so that is liberation according to the madhyamika school on the other hand the yogachara school believes in vigyanavada which says the reality exists in a moment whatever happened in the past and whatever will happen in the future is not real only the present moment is real okay see these are some interesting ideas which travel to china and and uh, became very popular so the madhyamika is the most dominant philosophy in chinese buddhism that is because of kumara jiva then there is another great personality bodhidharma who is supposed to be have, have been a pallava prince from south india and he traveled all the way to china and he established the shaolin monastery which is the most famous monastery in china and uh, there is the shaolin kung fu which is very famous so bodhidharma is also supposed to have introduced martial arts 
into China. So that the monks, you know, practice and they are able to uh, control their own body and minds. So martial arts is meant for personal control and also for defense because those days you could be attacked by animals or bandits and so on. So you needed to defend yourself. So Bodhidharma was such a great personality and he was an Indian who went to China. So he is supposed to have started what is known as Chan Buddhism in Chinese or which in Sanskrit would be Dhyana Buddhism, meditation. And this is a more of a iconoclastic type of a sect. Pure Land Buddhism, which is the mainstream Mahayana Madhyamika school, which talks about these Bodhisattvas and worshipping the Bodhisattvas to attain heavens, Pure Land heavens. Uh, the Chan Buddhist school recommends giving up of these worships and instead meditate, self-control. Okay, so that is supposed to have come from Bodhidharma and then it became very popular in Japan. It came to be known as Zen Buddhism and that, that name then travelled to the west where Zen Buddhism became very popular. Then some great Chinese uh, monks also came to India. For example, Fasian, he came to India during the Gupta dynasty period and he uh, wrote records of India. He studied in Indian University. The other great personality, most famous was Swan Tsang. Swan Tsang came to India during the time of Harshavard when Harshavardhana was ruling in North India. He studied in Nalanda University and he carried a lot of Sanskrit texts to China which were later translated into Chinese. And later on many of these Chinese texts were then translated into, into Tibetan language. And so when uh, the Islamic invasions came to India, a lot of these texts were destroyed. For example, Nalanda University was burned down by Bhaktiar Khilji and so all these Buddhist and all kinds of philosophical texts were destroyed. But they were preserved in China and Tibet because they, uh, they maintained or, or protected these uh, books in their own language, the, Sanskrit, transla uh, the translation of Sanskrit texts in Tibetan and the Chinese language. There is a famous book known as Journey to the West, very popular in, in, in China. So West is basically India. So India was referred to as the Western heaven. So one of the pure land heaven was the West. So there is a Swen Sang who travels to India. So on the way he is helped by the monkey king because he has to cross the snow, snowy mountains, the Himalayas. And so he faces a lot of difficulties and he faces many demons and, and powerful beings. And so the monkey king, king comes and helps him. Okay, so this is the, basically the story of how Buddhism entered into China. Mainstream Chinese Buddhism is Mahayana Buddhism. The Tibetan Buddhism is different from Chinese Buddhism, that is Tantric Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism. And then in southern parts, some southern parts of Yunnan province, there is Theravada Buddhism, which is the more simplistic form of Buddhism, which is prevalent in Southeast Asia. So because Yunnan province is attached to uh, Thailand uh, and, and, and Indochina, where, where uh, uh, Vajray, uh, sorry, Theravada Buddhism is popular. So it has some influence in that area. So if you take China as a whole, all three types of Buddhism are present in, in China. Now uh, there was also great persecution of Buddhism. So uh, for a long time Buddhism was very popular. But in uh, 845, the Thang Emperor Wu Chong, he decided to persecute the Buddhists. He banned Buddhism. He closed down monasteries because he believed this whole Buddhist system of Vihara and monks and nuns was uh, affecting the Chinese economy. It was a drain on the wealth of the Chinese state. And so he got these monks and nuns married and asked them to uh, uh, engage in agriculture and produce more crops so that uh, the revenue of the Chinese state increased. So this great persecution was started by Wu Chong and it continued. Uh, even after him. But then Buddhism revived in the form of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Chinese Buddhism also remained. Um, once the persecution ended, people were free to practice. But then Tibetan Buddhism became more popular. This is after the uh, 8th, 9th century. And uh, when the Mongols started ruling uh, China, so the Buddhism was their religion. So they also converted to Buddhism uh, later on. Once, once their empire was created, they invaded Tibet. So just like the Tibetans invaded India and they took with them Buddhism, similarly when the Mongols invaded Tibet, Tibet accepted the 
sovereignty of the Mongols. They accepted the Mongols as their masters, political masters, but the Mongols ac accepted Tibetans as their spiritual masters. So the Mongols also converted to Buddhism. Now, uh, in China, because Buddhism was so popular, uh, the, the Confucian scholars, they developed a new way. Instead of uh, trying to persecute Buddhism, what they, they do, did was they tried to develop a kind of a syncretic uh, lifestyle. So take some good things from Buddhism while criticizing other aspects of Buddhism because Confucians were completely opposed to the concept of karma and rebirth. They did not like the, those concepts. They were also opposed to this concept of bodhisattvas or lamas and so on. And, and, and so they rejected those, criticized them, but they took concepts like meditation, self-control, you know, the eightfold paths, right thinking, right action. So all these things they adopted from, from Buddhism. And so out of this coming together of ideas of Buddhism, Confucianism and Taoism, a new philosophy was created known as Neo-Confucianism. Okay, so it is it, it uh, Chu Si was was one of the great um, philosophers. Another one was Wang Yangming. So th these people basically wrote the Neo-Confucian texts, and the Neo-Confucian interpretation of the Confucian classics, the four books and the five classics, they became the orthodox doctrine of the Chinese state, and so. This was during the Song Dynasty period. So when the civil service exams uh, became became institutionalized, they became permanent. So the new Confucian interpretation was accepted. So there was some Buddhism also there. So this is a kind of a new development within within Chinese religion and Chinese theological understanding. Okay. And this continued, say, the civil service system that continued under the Mongols, under the Ming dynasty, then under the, the Qing. But then it became to decline because of the modern period. Now let's talk about some other religions. Let us discuss some um, other religions that are influenced in China, which, have, which are of course the dominant world religions, but uh, they have had very limited influence on China. Uh, in modern times, of course, they, have, they became more important. So, uh, in the ancient period, from the Tang dynasty period to the Ming dynasty period, the church of the east, so Christianity was also, you know, divided into different groups. So, there was this, the western church, which was centered around the Pentarchy, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Rome and Constantinople, they came to be known as the Pentarchy. But then towards the east, in, in uh, Iran and and uh, Mesopotamia, there was the church of the east. Now they started sending missions to China. Now Christianity is based on proselytization because they want the salvation of all mankind and they, they can be saved only if they know about Christ because Christ is the savior and if you don't know Christ, you won't go to heaven, everyone will go to hell. So that is the Christian doctrine. And so they sent missions to China but it was not very successful. Uh, Wu Chong, when he started the great persecution, he not only pers persecuted Buddhism, but also Christianity and Zoroastrianism. They were all banned in China. And even the later dynasties, for example, the Mongols, you know, they, Mongols, of course, were an international empire. So they spread all the way from Europe into Middle East, into China. So they came across all kinds of religions. Uh, in, in the Middle East, they, of course, came in contact with uh, Islam. In, in, in Tibet, they came across Buddhism, Tibet and China, two types of Buddhism. And then uh, when they uh, invaded uh, Europe, they came into con contact with the Eastern Orthodox Church in, in Russia. So, Mongols had re good relations with all religions. In fact, Mongols converted to some of these religions. In Europe, they converted to Eastern Orthodox and then in the Middle East and Central Asia, they became Muslims. And in China, they became Buddhist and also Mongolia, in fact, their own homeland adopted Buddhism as the religion. But when the Mongols were overthrown by the Ming, who were ethnic Chinese, they again banned Christianity. Okay, Christianity was again banned because Christianity was considered to be a very troublesome religion. Although Buddhism was also a proselytizing religion, but they were not on your face. They were just talking about good conduct. They were not saying if you convert to Buddhism, you will be saved or something like that because their emphasis was on good action. 
But Christianity was a unique type of a religion which believed in only one way, one path. Only through Jesus Christ is salvation. So if you accept Jesus Christ, only then you will be saved. Otherwise, you will go to hell. And therefore, the Chinese did not like this type of a doctrine. And so they banned Christianity. And then uh, Christianity again came in the modern era through the, uh, the colonizers, the Portuguese. So they, Portuguese were Roman Catholics. So, uh, so initially there was the Church of the East, then came the Eastern Orthodox Church and now came, came the Roman Catholics through the Jesuits. So the Jesuits came with the Portuguese, they visited the Chinese cities and they started converting people. They learned Chinese, they translated the Bible into Chinese, wrote pamphlets and asked the Chinese to adopt um, uh, Christianity. But of course under the Ming dynasty, Christianity remained illegal. But when uh, uh, Qing dynasty came to power, the great emperor Kangxi, he became very interested in Christianity. He in invited the Jesuits to his court and he, and he listened to their discourses on Christianity. He said that he is willing to convert to Christianity, but he cannot give up the veneration of Confucius and the ancestors. If the Christians allow that, then he is willing to convert to Christianity. So this matter was sent to the Pope. Pope Clement the 11th. So he, he was given the proposal by the Chinese Christians or, or, or the Jesuits in, in, in China that you should allow the emperor to continue with uh, ancestor worship and, and veneration of Confucius so that they become Christians and later generations can then be purified. But the Pope was very orthodox and he refused. He said that he won't allow idol worship into Christianity. And, and therefore, in 1704, he prohibited Confucian rituals for Christians. And uh, the emperor, Kangxi, he became very angry and he threw out all the Christians from his empire. From China, the, the Jesuits were expelled. And they remained expelled for a long time. Christianity again was illegal. Then in the 19th century, when China became weak and the European powers came and defeated the Chinese, then the protestant missions because the british were protestants the british were the first to defeat the chinese and so these protestant missions from america and britain started converting the chinese into protestantism and it was banned by the uh, by the qing but the qing had become weak by this time they were not very strong and so uh, the europeans were able to defeat them and, and and christianity began to spread in china in fact there was this whole uh, taiping uh, rebellion led by Hong Si Chuan, who considered himself to be the younger brother of Jesus Christ. He said that God, there is God the Father and God the Father has two sons, the elder brother and the younger brother. Jesus Christ is the elder brother and I, Hong Si Chuan, is the younger brother. So I have come to save China from all these demons. So he founded the heavenly kingdom of great peace with Nanqing as the capital. Uh, and he introduced a lot of social and economic reforms like he redistributed land among the peasants, he banned foot binding and many traditional Chinese practices. You know, he more, so he was admired by people like Mao Zedong because he, he is considered to be a kind of an early communist. But uh, the Qing dynasty was finally after great losses was able to defeat the Taiping rebellion and this uh, heretical Christian movement was also crushed and even the Europeans didn't like this because he was saying because Christianity believes there is only one son of God and Hung was saying there are two sons so that that was against Christianity also and so it was not successful. But some great uh, Chinese leaders, modern leaders like Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, they converted to Christianity and uh, Cha Charles Sung who was the father-in-law of both Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, he was a Christian. So these many founding fathers of Republic of China, they were Christians. Uh, we won't know how, how things would have played out if, if they had become the rulers of China. Perhaps it would have gone the way of South Korea where uh, you know, there is a, some kind of syncretic uh, culture. So there is Christianity as well as Buddhism and traditional Korean practices, they simultaneously exist. And Christianity is, is, is uh, a very powerful religion in Korea, uh, Protestant, basically Protestantism is, is, is a prevalent religion in Korea. So maybe China would have gone a similar way with Protestantism becoming an important religion in China. 
but uh, eventually the communist came to power and the communist adopted atheism as their religious point of view and they began to regulate christianity and and began to persecute them okay so that is the story of christianity in, uh, in china finally islam islam in china islam also came to china it the arab caliphate spread towards the east uh, but uh, they were came in conflict with the tibetans tibetan empire so uh, uh, the arabs form an alliance with the tang dynasty to defeat the tibetans and they were able to stop the tibetans from spreading both towards the west as well as towards the east and there was a lot of trade between the arabs and the chinese and many chinese uh, uh, many muslim traders in the on the silk route on that path they settled down okay the, to, in order to trade these muslim merchants settled in 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 china and they also converted some locals and intermarried and so on and so forth as a result islam developed in china and and the, and the chinese who were either settlers or, or or chinese converts they came to be known as hui muslims okay or the hui people so hui people in china are the chinese muslims at the same time the central asian turks they also converted to islam the turks became a very powerful entity they defeated the arabs and then became the leaders of the islamic world now the central asian people are turkic people so in china also the xinjiang province is turkic uyghur and uh, uh, mostly uyghur also kazakh and kyrgyz these are all turkic people so they have they converted to islam during this time and so there is a muslim presence in that sense also there is a hui muslims then there are the uh, turkic muslims there are two types of muslims in in um, china of course they are in yunnan province also because of influence of southeast asia there are some southern muslims are influenced by malaysia indonesia so on the or the greatest chinese admiral cheng he was also a muslim so the uh, the the ming dynasty they asked him to go on this voyage and they built huge ships for him treasure ships and these ships they uh, cheng he took to uh, southeast asia eastern africa west asia india and this, he shocked and awed the people there and and he also laid the seeds of islam in southeast asia in order to defeat the hindu kingdoms at that time uh, the the tamil kings had become weak the choras had were great they had built a great navy and defeated the southeast asian kingdoms the arabs had also began to de decline the turks were not very interested in the navy and uh, the europeans had not yet come to the scene so in, during this period there was a gap in the maritime power and so cheng he took advantage of this gap and in order to spread the influence of china in southeast asia he and and because southeast asia is ruled by these hindu kingdoms and so in order to you know counter them he established certain islamic settlements in in southeast asia which eventually then led to the conversion of the indonesians and malaysians into islam so this is a very important geo strategic game played by 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 the chinese led by Cheng He and Chinese influence increased because of that. But later on, because of their Confucian uh, ideas, uh, they stopped their maritime power projection. They became more defensive and inward oriented. Now, uh, the Muslims are also known to revolt. Whenever the Chinese empires became weak, they tried to assert their own independence, whether it's the Hui Muslim or the Turkic Muslims. They, we, we, we learn in history about different revolts that they had, especially, say, to, in the modern era when the Qing dynasty became weak and then the Qing dynasty would send their own soldiers to fight and defeat the Hui Muslims and the Turkic Muslims. The same thing happened under Republic of China. Chiang Kai-shek also sent his soldiers. In fact, he had some alliances with some of these Muslim generals who helped, helped uh, the Republic of China to defeat the rebels. The communists uh, again inherited the same system. They created two autonomous regions for the Muslims of China. One is the Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region. This is for the Hui Muslims, that is the uh, Chinese speaking Muslims. And then another Xinjiang. Xinjiang means new province. So Xin, Xinjiang province for the Uyghurs, the Turkic Muslims. Okay, so this is the So China has two autonomous regions for the Muslim minorities, none for the uh, Christians. So this is the map of China. You can see this Xinjiang. Uyghur autonomous region, this is for the Uyghur Muslim. Although because of migration, Han Chinese have become a majority here. Similarly, this small area region is 
Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region. This is also for Muslim. And then there are some areas like Yunnan, where there is uh, Buddhist as well as uh, Christian and Muslim, all kinds of influences. Uh, Tibet is Buddhist. Inner Mongolia is Buddhist. And in China also, there is a lot of influence of Buddhism. Okay, you can see uh, in China, five religions are recognized. Buddhism, Taoism, Catholicism, Protestantism and Islam. Confucianism is not considered a religion. So in terms of number, you can see these are the percentages. These are estimates because uh, the real data is very difficult to get from China. So this is a Pew Research data which says that uh, most Chinese people are unaffiliated. That is, they are uh, not religious. Then the largest religion in China is Buddhism. Which then Christian Islam. This is, this is what figures. There are others. Other traditional Chinese, they, they follow Taoism or worship ancestors and all that. But because of the communist unaffiliated majority. This is another figure given by put on international religious freedom by the American uh, Senate. And this has its own percentage to this. So, folk and ethnic is the largest group, Gnostic, then Buddhist, then Atheist, Muslims. So this is the end of a uh, division. Buddhist can be Han Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist. And then Christians are both Protestants and Catholics. Muslims are Sunni in, in, in China, but ethnically they can be either Hui, that is the Chinese Muslim or Turkic Muslim, Uyghur Muslim. So I think I have to... Uh, because we are running out of time, I will stop here uh, because there is something more to discuss. I will start from this slide in the next lecture. Uh, we are going to continue with this religion in China and uh, also discuss some uh, science and technology because religion is important but science and technology is even more important if you look at the modern scene. So uh, in the next lecture, I will initially discuss some religion and then go into science and technology in China. Thank you. Traditional Chinese thought is based on the Confucian cosmology. So it's, it's named after Confucius, but this cosmology is a product of generations of Chinese thinkers. And to an extent, even today in China, a kind of uh, a Confucian uh, mindset exists, although it has changed because of the communist revolution. So. Uh, According to the Confucian cosmology, at the top is heaven or Thian. Thian is at the top. Then below is the earth. Heaven at the top, earth at the bottom. In the middle is the sun of heaven. Thian Tzu is the sun of heaven, the Chinese emperor or in modern parlance, you will say the Chinese state. So according to the Confucian cosmology, the Chinese state is a, an intermediary between heaven, which is the truth, the cosmic law, and us, that is uh, the people on earth. So state plays a very important role in Chinese thinking. And at the center of this whole state system that exists on this earth is Chung Kuo, the Chinese nation. Chung Kuo is the Chinese nation at the center. In the middle is Qing, the capital, where the government resides. So government is at the center and then there are the Chinese people. And beyond that, there are two types of people. There are the tributaries and the barbarians. Those people who accept the greatness of Chinese civilization, they follow Chinese leadership, are the tributaries. And those who refuse to challenge Chinese supremacy are the 
barbarians so this is the ba a kind of a basic structure of chinese foreign policy thank you